So let's first look at our passage. Jesus is all I need because he is the author of creation. This is verses 15 through 17. Let me read them again. <clears throat> he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This is a very important passage for us as Christians because we must confess that Jesus Christ is God. If he is not God, we are not saved by him. Only God can save sinners perfectly and completely, and we must see that he is perfectly and completely revealed as God, not only in this passage, but all of Scripture. We lose everything if he is not God, and that's why Paul is pointing out he is preeminent. He is the final and ultimate authority because he is God. The key question is this. Is he the creator or is he part of the creation? That's the key question we have to ask. Let's look at verse 15. There's some, there's some technical language in this first part that I want to explain and walk through. He is the image of the invisible God. Now, what does it mean that he's the image? Does that mean he's, he's kind of like a reflection? As I look in the mirror, I, I can see myself. That's a lot like me, but it's not me. It, it's, it's a likeness of. That's what a lot of the early heretics confessed this passage taught. That he wasn't the perfect God. He was just a reflection of God, a, an emanation of God. That's really missing the entire point of this passage. He is the image of the invisible God. Really, we could say here he is the visible image of the invisible God. He is the exact revelation of God because he is God himself. He is the visible image of the invisible God. We sell this in the passage uh, Asher opened us with in Hebrews 1.3. He's the exact imprint. If you want to know who God is and see him, you look to Jesus because he is the exact imprint. Or John 1.18, no one has ever seen God, but the Son who is in his bosom is technically what it says, in the bosom of the Father, who is with the Father. He has made him known. He is the Son who reveals the Father perfectly. John 14 verses 9 through 10 are really the most clear passage that this is not saying that Jesus is just a mere reflection. When Philip said, show us the Father, Jesus says, when you see me, you see the Father. He'll say in another place, I and the Father are one. What you see me doing, that's what the Father is doing. You see, when we look at Jesus, we see God the Son. We see God himself revealed in the flesh. Now, when we looked at him in the flesh, it would have been incognito. He was really not much to look at, apparently, based upon Isaiah. But when you see him in his actions and his glory and his, his declarations with his authority, we would see God. One of the goals of humankind is to see God. That's what we were created to do. That's what we were created for, to know him, to see him. Remember Moses, he asked, Lord, can I see your glory? God said, no. You're too sinful and I'm too holy. You cannot see my glory. But I'll show you my, my, my hind part, my, my backside. I, you can't see my face. It will overwhelm you and you'll be destroyed because you're too much a sinner and I'm too holy. So he revealed part of himself. Now, however, God revealed himself fully. He's no longer speaking through prophets like Moses. He's speaking through his own son. Jesus has come to be the perfect and absolute revelation of God. We can see it in what he taught. He did not come to abolish the law. No, he came to fulfill it. He came to teach what it truly meant. He came and spoke with absolute authority. They were amazed at how he taught and what he proclaimed. He came and declared the truth of God. Crowds walk away, walked away amazed. We see God in how he lived. He proclaimed the truth of God. He pointed people to God, the Father. He confronted sin, the gross sin of rebellion and the gross sin that God sees in our self-righteousness. He taught 
and lived so that we would see the love of God, the power of God, and the truth of God. He lived in such a way that we would know that God is our Father, that we would love Him above all else, that we would love our neighbor like we love ourselves. We would find peace with God. He made the will of God known to us. Point is this. He is all we need to see the face of God. Jesus Christ, if we seek after him and want to see him, we will see God. Now many of you are saying, well, that's 2,000 years ago. We don't get to walk with Jesus like the disciples walk with Jesus. If only Jesus could walk in like he did in Jerusalem, then we could see him and then we would believe. No, you wouldn't. Seeing is not believing. How many people looked at Jesus and got to hear Jesus with their actual ears and see him with their eyes and walked away denying him? Being amazed and somewhat inspired, but denying that he was God and the Savior. One of the most amazing passages is John 16, 7, where Jesus is giving instruction on the Holy Spirit. He tells them, he tells the disciples, it's to your advantage if I leave. Because when I leave, the Holy Spirit will come. You see, it's not with our eyes and our ears that we will get to know God. It's with our hearts. It's when the Holy Spirit regenerates us and illuminates us and allows us to see God in his glory. It's when the Holy Spirit reveals to us from his word that he has inspired that God is great, that God is almighty, that Jesus Christ is God, and that he is our Savior. You see, if we want to see God, we can see him today. Not with the eyes of our flesh, but with the eyes of our heart. We can see him and know him but we have to do it the way he has ordained it to be. We see him by trusting the Holy Spirit. We see him by reading the word that points us to him, reading the word that he has given to us, and praying that the Spirit would illuminate us so that we can see him. Now here's what gets in the way of seeing God. It's our sin. See, right now we can only see in a mirror dimly, and that dimness is our sin. It affects the way we think, it affects the way we desire, it affects the way we love. Our sin is what keeps us from seeing God clearer and clearer. The more we repent of sin, the clearer our vision of God will be. It's not my raspy throat that's going to keep us from hearing God and seeing God today. It's our sin. That's the major obstacle. It's how much we want to repent and be done with our old way of life and start seeing God and Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father. We must seek him in his word. We must seek him with the saints and the fellowship. We must seek him in prayer. We must seek him in repentance. So Christ, we get to see God in Christ as he's revealed to us in his word and through the Spirit. Let's look at this next term, firstborn of all creation. Again, a fairly technical term here. Now, you may ask, why are all these terms so technical? This is one of the great passages that exalt Christ. Why is it so technical? Our language is not designed to describe God. I can tell you what a table is. Four legs, flat top, you can put stuff on it. My, our language is for this finite created world. I can describe things of this created order fairly well with the language we have. But our language can never describe God fully or completely. Now the, the most amazing thing is the fact that God has used our language to reveal himself so we have a reliable, sufficient word. But we have to use some, some technical, difficult terms here and there to make sure we are protecting the truth of God. So what does it mean that Jesus Christ is the firstborn of all creation? Well, the ancient Aryan heretics and the the Jehovah's Witnesses of our day, they focus on the born aspect of this. He was born. He he had a beginning. Just like when we have children, they have a beginning and they're dependent upon whoever uh, gave them birth. I think they're missing the real focus here about being the firstborn. Who 
was Israel's firstborn child. Not the nation, the person Israel. I'm sorry, I completely messed that up. <laughs> Who was Isaac's firstborn child? Who was Isaac's firstborn child? Who? Esau. Esau was the first one birthed. But who was the real firstborn child? Jacob. You see, it's not about the birth. It's about the status. It's about the position. He is the heir of the inheritance. Because it's not about when being born. It's a special status you receive from the father. This is not declaring that he was born or that he had a beginning. No, it's declaring a special status status he has, an authoritative status over all creation. He stands over creation as the firstborn. Well, maybe it's not clear yet that he belongs to the class of creator and not creature. Let's look at verse 16, the grounding of these two declarations. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So verse 16 is really relating to verse 15 because it's giving a ground and a reasoning for those declarations. He's the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn because all things were created for him. We see that repeated twice. And then we have in the middle of that a description of what all things are. He is the beginning. He is the one who has created all things. We see this in John 1, 3. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Here we see the clear de declaration. He's a creator. Everything that is created was created by him. Now we can get more precise here if we look at 1 Corinthians 8. 8.16. It says, For from the Father came all things through the Son. That makes perfect sense in giving a commentary on Genesis 1, doesn't it? In the beginning was God, and He spoke creation into existence. The Father declared creation into existence through His Word, and we know that Jesus Christ is the Word who became flesh. You see, the Son participates in creation. He is the Word that God the Father speaks to bring creation about. He is the one who creates. He is the Creator. Let's look at how all things are further described. All things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. It's, it's pretty encompassing. It's it's all things, no matter how we would look at it, physical, spiritual, in heaven or in earth. Specifically, I think Paul <clears throat> is going after the fact that angelic beings were created. That's what I believe he's referring to with the thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities. It's the same thing he refers to in Ephesians 1.21. Christ has been raised from the dead and he's at the Father's side far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. You see, the Colossians' problem is the fact that they have started to look at other beings to help them accomplish approaching God. They see there's a great chasm, there's a great rift between God and man, and they're thinking if we'll, we can only trust the angels, they can get us kind of up there to help us, to help Christ and what he's done for us. He's pointing out that Christ himself has created all of these beings. Why would he need them? Why should we depend upon them that are dependent upon Christ? He needs no help. We have to remember here the backdrop of this because it's not illogical in, in, in some sense. The hierarchy of being is this, God, angels, and man. That's the hierarchy of being, God, angels, and man. I, I get that from the fact that Jesus being God is said to have been made a little lower than the angels when he took on flesh. So it's God, angels, and man. And so these Colossians are looking and saying, how can I get to God? Well, I need to 
look for some mediums. The angels can serve as the medium so that I can help get to God. And Paul's point is, you don't need any mediums because God himself has come straight down to you so he can bring you straight back up to him. He does not need to depend upon any other power. Jesus Christ is sufficient. Now, I, I know most of you in the room, and I don't see you depending upon angels. I, I don't think this is a, a problem that I, I see in Jefferson Park Baptist Church. I, don't, I wouldn't write this kind of letter to you all. But something that has plagued the church and always will plague the church, every church, is depending upon other powers. Typically, it's our own. Typically, it's me thinking, if I can just do this, God will love me more. Typically, it's me saying, if I could just accomplish this good work, it will help Christ love me and take care of me and serve me better. I'm always tempted to think, if I just started doing this, I could accomplish more in Christ. Friends, that's self-righteousness. We first need to repent of our sin. See sin on the cross and see what Christ has done for us and then respond. We are too dependent upon our power, not angelic powers. Let's look at this last phrase of verse 16. All things were created by him and for him. It's very similar, almost the exact same phrase all the way up to the very end. Where it says all things were created by him and then for him. That's the real addition here. He, he bookends that all things were created by him, but now we have all things were created for him. Jesus Christ was our intended origin and our intended end. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Jesus Christ is God, is our origin. He's our source of life, and he is the purpose of life. If we want to be happy in this life, we must seek to have our purpose and our end in Jesus Christ. We've talked about wisdom a lot on Wednesday night and Sunday morning. Wisdom is knowing what the proper end is and knowing how to accomplish it. Christ is the end and the means to reach that end. He is our goal in life to worship, to love, to serve. And he is the way that we do that by forgiving us and calling us and equipping us. Verse 17, he is before all things. Here the he is is very similar to the I am of Exodus. If you're a, a, a Hebrew, you hear the he is, you hear the I am, the Yahweh, the very power that was able to disable the Egyptians and free Israel. He's now destroying the power of sin. He is before all things, again declaring his preeminence and his authority, his position. In him, all things hold together. He's the creator and the sustainer. Reminds me of Acts 17, 28, when Paul quotes uh, a philosopher agreeing with him. In him we live and move and have our being. He is the one who is sustaining everything and keeping everything. The key question is, do we trust him? as he holds all things together? Do we trust God and his wisdom and his power to keep holding all things together? When our lives feel like they're unraveling, when they feel too chaotic, are we trusting that he is holding all things together? Do we trust that he is in control? And do we seek him in prayer or do we seek to go out and fix things first? 